First of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Brigadier General Mahmoud Mustafi and his team for inviting me to chair this session. Uh, both the, we have listened to both the speakers. I think both the speakers have done a very good job with their topic. And they have explained everything we need to know. About the first speaker, uh, which was sepsis. Uh, AKI in sepsis is multifactorial. It's not uh, unifactorial. There are many factors which, can, which causes or contribute to AKI in sepsis starting from interrenal hemodynamic change to cytokine storm and uh, infiltration of inflammatory cells in the renal parenchyma and also intraglomerular thrombosis and also uh, blockage of the tubules by the necrotic cells and debris. So all this play a role in producing AKI in sepsis. So it's multifactorial. So it's, that's why it's treatment is also difficult because it's a multifactorial and we have to but about the biomarkers, I think uh, there were some recent publications in several studies. They have shown that interleukin-18 rises even 24 to 48 hours before patient develops AKI. So if you get a very high interleukin-18 in a patient in seps with sepsis, so you can predict that this patient is going to develop AKI. So you can be careful. And another is uh, NGEL, NGEL, that is neutrophil gelatinous aspirated lipocalcin. So NGEL, both urine and plasma NGEL is also increased uh, at a very uh, increased to a very high level in patients uh, with septic AKI compared to non-septic AKI. So these are the uh, two markers which is showing very promising uh, uh, results to predict AKI in septic patients. So we can use that. I think. Um, uh, I don't know about the treatment thing. I think she has described everything we can do about treatment. The recently, they tried two other treatments. There's NTTNF uh, monoclonal antibody. So that has been tried. Uh, it showed uh, pro uh, good results in one study, but uh, in another study, it had no effect. Uh, another, another one is activated protein C. And activated protein C is now being used in many centers because it has a very good effect of uh, combating AKI in septic patients. So these are a few things I wanted to add. About the second speaker who was speaking about CKD and tuberculosis, uh, he has described everything we need to know about this topic. Uh, I just want to add a few points. One is CK, uh, TB is common in CKD. Uh, also in dialysis patients and transplant patients because those patients are immunocompromised. So all this, I not only that, if somebody has got latent tuberculosis, that can become over tuberculosis when the patient develops CKD or patient is on dialysis or patient uh, get go, uh, gets a renal transplant. So this thing we have to keep in mind that uh, and, uh, TB is quite common. About the drugs, I think the one drug you have to be very careful about is ethambutol because it is, it is more than 80% is renally excreted. So if you have renal impairment, so there will be increased blood level of ethambutol and that can cause irreversible permanent ocular toxicity. So that's why you have to be very careful about ethambutol and you sh I think the dose has been shown, it's been reduced and many uh, so if, even if, if you have to give it ethambutol, so you have to be careful about its doses. And you can, if you have facilities, you can do a serum ethambutol label to see uh, what is the level of ethambutol in that patient. And other drug is pyrazinamide. And if a patient INH, you don't need to bother about rifampicin INH. These two drugs can be given with full doses in all patients of CKD. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether the patient has dialysis or transplant, uh, uh, without transplantation. I, I will talk about transplantation later. So. Uh, so you can give full doses of prehempicin INH. You have to be care, uh, careful about pyrazinamide and thambutal. So both these drugs is advised or given thrice daily, uh, thrice weekly, three times a week, not daily exactly. So that's one thing. Uh, the other is almost all the antitubercular drugs are dialyzable to some extent. Pyrazinamide is highly dialyzable, but other drugs are also dialyzable. So if the patient is on dialysis, it is advised to keep treatment after dialysis. So you should give treatment after dialysis if the patient is on dialysis. On the dialysis days, you should have to give the drugs after dialysis. And about transplantations, it's better to avoid rifampicin patient because rifampicin is a very strong enzyme inducer. So it will decrease the level of steroids and also decrease the level of uh, CNIs, uh, tracrolimus or cyclosporin. 
Uh, that's why uh, you have to increase, if you have to give it from basin, then you have to increase the doses of uh, cyclosporine or tracrolimus. And uh, so you can, uh, you can also check the serum levels of those drugs when you are prescribing rifampicin. Uh, it is better to, if you can avoid, you should avoid rifampicin. Otherwise, a patient can get a re rejection of their transplants. So there are a few things I wanted to add. I don't think I need to add any more thing. So thank, thanks to both the speakers for their nice job. And thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you.